Okay, so welcome everyone. Nice to have you here. Also welcome to everyone who is listening to this on SoundCloud. Now, today we have another question, this time from Eliza. Very interesting question. So she asks, Hi Toby, I have a question. When I turn to face thoughts, there is nothing there. Just stillness and silence. Where do thoughts arise from? I can read about this, like neural processes, etc. However, I'm interested in your experience. Many thanks, Eliza. Okay. Very good question. So obviously, Eliza has been doing some serious practice. And then these kind of questions arise from your practice. If you sit down, you really do your meditation, you do it regularly, you do it every day, and you eventually get deeper, these kind of questions might arise. So where do thoughts come from? You're looking at them, you see them arise, you see them pass. It's kind of interesting. You're not caught up in them anymore so much, but still there is this kind of interest, right? Where where do they come from? And, or you can also ask, where do they go? In terms of location, think of it in terms of a location, does a thought have any location? Can you, can you kind of locate it with your awareness? Can you see where it is? Is it felt somewhere in your body? It kind of appears like it has some location where most people feel that they're thinking kind of up in the head, that the thinking feels like it's in the head. Rarely do we think that uh, I'm feeling my thoughts in my elbows or something like that. We're usually feeling them kind of in the head. Mm -hmm. Then if you look closer, you kind of you zoom in, like with a microscope, you're zooming in, you're looking at it. Where exactly, though? In the head. Left side, right side, and then you begin to explore and you feel your head as it actually is. When your eyes are closed, you, you, you don't see your head, right? You don't see your head. Even if your eyes are open, you don't really see your head. You can only kind of feel it and sense it. And if you're looking at that feeling, it's kind of like an amoeba, actually. It's not really, it's like amorphous, kind of some energetic buzzing, actually. You can imagine it as a head, of course. You can give it a name, you can say, well, that's my head. But it, actually, as a matter of fact, it, there's just a, a buzzing kind of feeling there. And within that kind of buzzing sensation that you call head, where is the thought exactly coming from? And you look closer and closer. And the more you look, the less you find. It happens to scientists too, by the way. The more they look, the less they find. <laughs> it's a funny thing. Did you know that, for example, an atom is mostly just empty space, 99 point, and then you add 12 times the number 9 after the point percent of empty space? Nothing. That's an atom. So you can say matter is Mostly just empty space. Huh. Like I said, we're looking, but we're looking for some core. Right? Scientists are also looking for some core. They want to find that thing in there. That special kind of thing. Where is that thought thing? Or we presume that there is this kind of thing there that I can find. There is the thought. It appears rather like a concrete sort of blob that you can get a hold of if you're just looking in the right place. But as Eliza describes nicely, her practice is obviously working out quite well, so all she finds is stillness, silence, emptiness. Not a re you cannot really find a thought. You can look closer and closer Zoom in more and more, and you find less and less. 
a thought is a very ethereal process. It's not actually a solid thing. And yet, it has us fooled into fighting wars, into worrying about the elections, into electing, and so forth. All that, isn't it? As you look today, you look uh, online, you see the, the results of the elections, you've seen that Trump is now president, that it gives you a certain feeling and it steers up more thoughts and more worries and more fears in many people. It's not helpful at all. But it has a huge power and momentum at the moment, everywhere in the world. The ethereal stuff that's going on in our heads. We're taking it very, very seriously, actually. But there's nothing really there. Like a dream. As long as you don't know that you're dreaming, it's serious stuff that's going on. <clears throat> Someone just stole your car in a dream. You're feeling genuine worry. You're stressing out at night. That's all because you don't know you're dreaming, isn't it? And so most people in this world are hopelessly tied up in their mind stuff. For them is, at this moment, no way out. Because there's no interest. A way to invest it in the mind stuff. So it doesn't make any sense to go around and make people different. It doesn't help. You just want to change, then it helps. You kind of want to get out of this. It helps. Because then you have the interest to look at yourself and to really see, oh, what's going on inside of me? Is it, is it really real? Is it really a threat? Are my thoughts really threatening me? Like this. And you will find nothing. You will just find more and more stillness, more and more silence. The more you look with a clear eye, directly looking at your own experience, understanding, well, suffering is pretty unnecessary. You don't have to suffer. It's kind of an option. But it's not an option if you don't know. then it's a must for you. It's a must to suffer. You'll go through the process of suffering until it's kind of enough for you. And so you have some interest. And you feel like, well, it can't go on like this. I need to get out of this suffering. Think about it. If everybody in this world would make that decision, let me find the end of suffering within my heart. Now this world would completely change. There's no need to worry. There's no need to be scared and afraid. I mean, because we see the root of all trouble, the root of all problems, is our own mind, not other people. Not other things. The suffering is inside of you. Every single one of you guys including myself, including those of you who are listening. That's where the suffering is. That's where the stress is. That's where the tension is. And that's where it also finds an end, if you want it to find an end. And one of the fastest, most efficient ways of finding an end of suffering is looking at your mind, looking at your thoughts. Because that's kind of the biggest, the biggest issue, is thinking. You can say, the, the mental movies, I like to call it like a mind movie. It's not only thinking, it's also images and memories and future projections and ideas and whatnot. Self ideas and the whole self construct, me and my life story, that one. Us and our life story. That one. 
as in in the head. And it rotates with great speed all the time. And it has you captivated, like a dream has you captivated. I've had so many dreams in which I was actually saying to another person, uh, like talking to you like this, I was, I was telling them, you know, this could be a dream. And I was dreaming and I didn't notice it. <laughs> Just this afternoon I had, a, I, had, I had a nap. And in the dream I became conscious that I'm dreaming. And I notice and I'm like, whoa, this, this could be a dream. <laughs> And then I woke up in the dream, but I didn't wake up really. I just woke up in the dream uh, because I fell asleep in my dream, actually. And as I fell asleep in my dream, I kind of noticed that I'm dreaming in my dream. But then I woke up and I came back into the normal dream. See, it's no real realization. We're not understanding anything. We're not seeing that. Actually, we're dreaming it all up. What is really there? What is truly there right now? What is a fact? There's just six things. Sounds, sight, smell, taste, feeling, and thought. That's it. That's what's really there. And we have this tendency to get caught up in any of those and make stories about them, attach to them, identify with them like identify with our thoughts. We get really upset when someone disagrees with, with my opinion because I'm right. How can they disagree? Don't they, don't they get it? Don't they get the point? Like this. And so we, we argue and fight endlessly in this world because of stuff in our head that doesn't matter at all. What matters is, are you happy? good, then that's what you share with the world right now. Are you suffering? Well, let go. That's what matters. Not your opinions and views and that you're right and others are wrong and that the world should be like this or could be like that. It doesn't matter. It keeps the world spinning for millennia the way it is. Just people fighting people. People disagreeing with people. Views, opinions, perceptions. Endless. Look at human history. It's an endless turning around. Thousands of years of wars. Peace. Then war again. Then peace again. Everywhere on the planet. You see, it turns around on the planet. Sometimes the war is in the east. Then it's in the west then there's peace in the East. <laughs> For thousands of years, tens of thousands of years. Why? Because in our mind there is greed, anger. We're annoyed, unhappy people. And we don't see that one. That's why we carry it around in the world. And so the root of all suffering is in the mind. We find it in the mind. And we eliminate it in the mind. And that's why we meditate. That's the point of it, isn't it? Now to come back to Eliza's question, a bit sidetracked. Now if, uh, if you're looking at your thought and you're wondering, uh, where does it really come from? That wondering in itself, where does the thought come from? That's a thought too. Thoughts do arise from habitual tendencies. At first, if you observe, there might be some sort of sense input. Like you hear a sound outside or someone says something. And then usually the thought follows quite fast. Oh, rain. Oh, it's raining again. Oh, my God, it's been raining for three months now. When does it ever stop? I thought the weather is getting better. Like this, you know. So, and then quickly, also what thoughts do, they're quite linear. They're, they're kind of developing into more and more. The thoughts are proliferating, they're expanding, so to say. You have that one thought and it leads you to the next thought and it leads you to the next thought and so forth. 
So if you want to understand where thoughts come from, you can look into nature actually. It's quite a nice example. Where does a cloud come from? Any ideas? It's evaporation, right? So we all know that. So it comes from evaporating water, which comes up into higher regions, it cools down, it turns into a cloud, it condenses and so forth. And then, where does the water come from that's on the ground? The oceans, for example. Where does the ocean water come from? Well, it is nourished by the rivers. And where do the rivers come from? They come from the springs, it comes from the deeper water. Where, does the, where is that filled up? It's filled up by the rain. Where does that come from? It comes from the clouds. So you have that kind of natural cycle, you see? For thoughts, it's very similar. Sense, input, memory, you start to label, it starts to spin around, you create habitual stories that match up with your personality, that come from your personality. If you are a worrier, then you have worrisome thoughts. You hear the sound of the rain, and the worrier becomes active. You start to worry about, will there be more rain? Oh God, again, no more rain. It's too much rain, or right? it's like this. If you are like the optimist, then you say, ah, great, the plants get some fresh water. And, uh, you know, the groundwater tanks are filled right now. Ah, nice. Nature is such a miracle. <laughs> you know, whatever it is that you feel, but it is according to how you are primed. So you can say, for example, that the way you think, what types of thoughts arise in your being, it is formed since you are a child. And if you want to take, I don't want to take really talk about past lives or future lives, because it requires to, uh, to go into another kind of realm, so no need. So if you believe in past and future lives, let's say like this, that is part of your view, then can come from past lives too. A very ancient being. So in a way, there is no beginning to thought. It's this kind of movement, it's this, all the conditions are coming together, sense inputs habitual tendencies and all that. That is where thoughts are coming from. So it's not that thoughts kind of appear without a cause out of nothing. They do have causes. A thought can arise from its cause. So what can be a cause for a thought? Like sense input. Or the habit to think. If you're thinking a lot, let's say you're watching a lot of movies, you watch the election results, you browse a lot the internet, then there is a lot of thinking, there's a lot of habitual tendency to think about the world. So it's a habit, basically. That's all it is, you know. It's like, if there is an itch, you scratch. Where does the itch come from? It has its causes. Right? So let's just keep it at that, because it's not really that important where they come from exactly, or where they go. Uh, where do thoughts come from? Where do they go? These kind of questions. Basically, you. this is like a, a very uh, unstable ground. It goes very much into opinion making. So I have an opinion that thoughts come from emptiness. Others say, oh, no, no. Thoughts are coming from this, and then others say, no, they come from that, and they come from your own mind, and your mind comes from that. And, and so, they, some scholars say that, others say that, okay? So it's not that important. The Buddha also didn't really talk too much about these kind of things, actually. He said, look at the thought right now. If, if there is a thought, look at it. See really into it. What's really there? And keep watching. This is something that shouldn't really be discussed so much. It sh should happen in your own meditative experience. Really look at thoughts, experience. What do you see? And that stillness that Eliza is seeing there, what she says, two words, stillness and silence or something. Let me have a look again. Just stillness and silence, yes. Now, once we are entering that stillness and silence, the gap, 
relax into that. Stay in that stillness, stay in that silence. And then become very quiet in there. And then watch. Where does exactly, where does the next thought come from? There's something you need to experience. You need to see it. And by that we can also understand the real nature of thoughts. What, what is a thought really? And if you keep looking like that, you stop buying into your thoughts. You eventually recognize, oh well, it's just thinking. And that's great. If you can look at your own mind and go, oh, just thinking. <laughs> That is so liberating. Ah, it's just a movie. Oh my God, I totally forgot. <laughs> I was just dreaming it up. And so more and more often you can catch yourself in this. I have to find where thoughts are coming from. This is a certain tension. That is itself is a thought. And notice that right now in this present moment, how is it like trying to find out where thoughts are coming from? That is an experience of lack, isn't it? I feel like there's some lack and I need to fill that with some knowledge. It is in a way a very subtle kind of craving. It's a craving for some sort of intellectual or even spiritual fulfillment. Look, I need to find, I need, this is the piece of the puzzle that's missing. Where do they come from, these thoughts? And you kind of want to pinpoint it down, you want to give it a name. Yes, they come out of emptiness. Or yes, they are like, uh, you know, they, they, they nourish themselves or something like that. And then once you can say that, it feels like, yes, now I have some safety. There's a little box and I can put my experience into that little box. I can put a sticker on the box and say, yes, the emptiness box. That's where my thoughts are coming from. It gives you a sense of security. Yeah, I know what's going on. I'm in control, so to say. Also analyze that. Have a look at that too. Analyze it, don't mean think about it, but, but actually watch it. As you sit there in meditation and then that idea comes up. Wow, just stillness and peace. But where are thoughts coming from? Why not just rest in the stillness and the peace and dive deeper into it? Allow it to really, really take over. Forget yourself in it. Give yourself up in it the one that inquires, the one that needs, the, the one that wants to find out, the thinker. Where are thoughts coming from? Where do they go? Give it up. Let it go. Isn't it the, the essence of the path? Let go. This is this, almost this subtle itch. You need to find out where the thoughts are coming from. It's an intellectual itch and you want to scratch it, just let it go. And the, the itch, it will go away by itself and you will come to rest more and more in that silence, in that peace. And the more you rest in it, the more the, the, the kind of the dreamt up world of thought is fading, it's losing its power. And it can be a threat to some people actually. If you're very identified with your intellect, you feel like, I'm a someone that has an opinion. It can be a great threat to surrender that, to stillness and peace. Actually, we all want to be happy and peaceful, but we're equally scared of peace, of real silence, of just how profound it can get. In, in a good meditation session. It, it can genuinely scare the hell out of you. We're very scared of ourselves. Beings are very scared of ourselves. We like security. We like our boundaries and 
our little kind of territory where everything is kind of nicely labeled and identified and if that is this and that is that and you go deeper and deeper in meditation and things become more and more fishy and kind of you, you don't really understand them properly anymore it just dissolves in front of your eyes and this is a threat to, to the intellect it's a slap in the face to the intellect isn't it but that's the itch that's the discomfort that we feel of not knowing something and here I'm just actually telling you can you be comfortable with not knowing can you let that go too can you leave it alone too I, I don't know okay <laughs> I have no idea all right and just leave it at that don't go any further into it I don't know where thoughts are coming from good let it go and suddenly there's this fantastic insight coming up a fantastic enlightenment experience total emptiness total you're totally dissolving in whatever and you come back and you say wow that was awesome now what was it <laughs> let it go too it's kind of a funny story there is a one of the monks coming to uh, Ajahn Sumedho and actually telling him uh, you know I think I got it uh, I have the the first enlightenment stage I think I I got stream entry that's the first stage of enlightenment he said why well, I think I got it he comes to this great master and the, and the master says oh great another thing to let go of this is the path we're holding nothing not holding knowledge not holding intellect not holding thoughts not holding anything nothing that's what you do in your meditation you sit there quietly you hold nothing I do understand and for most people the concept of actually living a life in that state is totally beyond so for us on our level I think it's great if you can do it in your meditation session just totally leave everything alone just for once in your day right just stop all doing rest you actually do it every night you just don't know it you do it in deep sleep you let go of everything you come to the ground of your experience that's why it's so refreshing that's why your cells are restoring you become healthy in it because you're gone you're out of the way for maybe 30 minutes and then you come back into dream sleep so in meditation we're cultivating that we are sinking down into that and you sink down if you let go oh that one too I let it go too where do thoughts come from oh I let it go too who am I let it go too I don't need to know who I am I'm comfortable with not knowing who I am <laughs> you see and this is it's scary stuff it's scary stuff you don't know who you really are if the thinking stops who are you I'm Toby it's just four letters T-O-B-I just the noise Toby 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 if you say it frequently it becomes weird If I sit down in meditation and I, I tell myself, who am I? And then I go, I am Toby. I am Toby. And I keep repeating it like a mantra, I am Toby. It becomes such a weird thing. It's just thinking, is it? It's not who I am. It's just a voice in my head saying, I'm Toby, I'm Toby. But that's not who I am. Is it? It's just something you reply when someone asks you. Who are you? And I'm Sam Toby. But being comfortable with just really being nothing. Not having to get anywhere. Not having to become anyone. Not needing anything. <laughs> that is where you relax. And this is where happiness is. 
once you get over the initial kind of start-up fear, this is where you can deeply relax and refuel and find an incredible sense of joy. As you can see, kind of babies are a bit more close to this, to this form of joy. It's more easy for them to just be randomly joyful. And for an adult, it seems harder. To me, that's a sense of, yeah, you are failing in life. You are not able to be just happy and joyful. This is a sense of failure, actually, I feel. We're doing something wrong. It's hard for us to be happy. Well, what are we doing wrong? Where, where is it? Where has your happiness gotten lost on the way? Why is it that uh, states like anxiety, fear of rejection, uh, depression, worries, they have a predominance in, in most adult people's lives. What went wrong? I have a fear of rejection in my personality. I'm scared that people reject me. Why? Where does that come from? Anger and anxiety and worries about the future. Why? Fear of not being loved, not being appreciated. Why? Where have I learned that? Is it useful? If it's not useful, I'll just let it go then. Drop it. Leave it alone. Let it go. And it will fade slowly, slowly. Because we're not giving it importance anymore. I'm not giving me and my suffering so much importance anymore. Because most of it is really just thinking. Just the mind go buzzing. So in a way you can maybe find out, you can read books about where do thoughts come from, you can listen to many masters' teachings and one master will tell you this, another master will tell you that. And in the end, we still don't know really where thoughts are coming from. <laughs> now, not knowing where thoughts are coming from is like this. Just look at it. Not knowing is like this. Sometimes I also I feel very tempted. I get this kind of question. I feel very tempted to display some intellectual quality and to kind of to show that I know, but it's pointless because I don't. I don't know where thoughts are coming from, really. I've read a few things also, like Eliza, she said, I could read on this. And I have read a few things, but I don't really know really where do they really come from. Where do they go? There's no location. I haven't found any location so far. I see that they're conditioned and they arise and pass according to their nature. And that's okay, that's good enough. Seeing them like this. Not intellectually understanding them. Or not observing them to the point where... where you see the, the where, the exact point, so you can pinpoint it down and you can say, that's where they are coming from. It's like the water example I gave with the cloud, isn't it? If you look at a river and you cannot pinpoint it down, where does the water molecule come from? It's endless, it's beginningless. Do you see? That you can't really find any beginning. Like, where does that tree come from? Where does that atom come from? How can you find a beginning of that? It's impossible. Or, or, or like really aware. Impossible. You can think about it. 
juggle it around in your head. It doesn't change the fact that we still suffer. And maybe it might be also a good idea if these kind of questions or these kind of might not even be like a verbal question in your head, but just like a feeling you want to know. Then look at that feeling. And then don't touch it. Just leave it. Let it come, let it go. And then something else will happen. That feeling goes away. I want to find out where my thoughts are coming from. You let go. You wait a little bit, then there's a sound. Then suddenly you're annoyed. Only you let go of annoyance and suddenly there's peace. Just keep looking like this. Not doing anything to anything. Not sorting out the world. Letting go of it. This is deep meditation. And that deep meditation arises from proper basics. Do you feel your body right now? Always ask it. Do you feel your body right now? Do you feel your feet, your arms, the way you sit? Keep your mindfulness spread out through the body like this throughout the entire day. Stabilize it. Stabilize and empower the knower like this. And when the knower is very strong, you can look very nicely into things. You can understand them and let them go. And then there is peace. One more thing to say about letting go. And that is very important. Letting go is not indifference. It's super important. Many people mistake letting go for indifference. Or are we supposed then not to take care of anything? Just let go. Of course not. If you're crossing a street and a car comes rushing and you're like, oh, psh, just letting go. And so you're just standing there and waiting to get hit. That is not letting go. In the morning, you're not getting up. You're not getting out of bed to do your work because you let go. What will happen if you let go like this? You die very fast. Oh, I want to eat, but pfft, I let go. I don't eat. I need to go to the toilet, but I let go. That's not right letting go. <laughs> this is trouble. Many people mistake letting go for indifference. This is very, very common. And it takes often many times me saying it over and over again. No, 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 I'm not meaning indifference. It does not mean not caring. It just simply means you not suffering. But everything else is still normal. You still go to the toilet. <laughs> you still go to work. You still talk with people. You sleep, you wake up, you do what you do. Just no suffering. No stress. That's letting go. Make sense? This is a, close to my heart, this one, because it's so often it's misunderstood. It kind of bugs me every time. It's like, ah, oh, man, it's not indifferent. <laughs> it is letting go. Uh, really leaving things, leaving things be, but still being active. Still doing what you do. Doing good things. Yes. I was just thinking, you have to live a normal life and care yes. in order to create the things that you need to let go of. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You create your life and you let go, right? It's almost a bit like you are in a dream and you know you're dreaming. You still do the dream stuff, right? But you, you are having much more fun because it's not, it's not serious anymore. It's not heavy anymore. It's just a dream. Life is quite similar. It's like a dream. It's not a dream, but it's like a dream. So no need to take it so seriously. What's going on right now with the elections and stuff? It's been going on for thousands of years all the time, isn't it? It's a hot topic right now. I'm sorry I'm bothering you with it too. 
But it's, 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 it's like that. It's been going on for thousands of years. It's repeating itself over and over and over again. So why bother? Relax. You vote. You do your thing. You bring goodness into the world. It's that simple. You have some happiness in your heart? Share that. It's as good as it gets. The more people are sharing happiness, the better. The less power goes to problematic things. Okay. I think it's enough for today.